On the morning of December 27, 2013, Muhammad Shatta woke up at around 7 a.m. to read the news. He had a meeting in downtown Beirut and told his wife Nina he would meet her for lunch outdoors as the weather was beautiful. He wouldn't be long. At 9.40 a.m., a bomb estimated to weigh more than 50 kilograms placed in a stolen vehicle went off as Muhammad Shatta's convoy was passing by. The explosion left him and seven others dead, with dozens wounded. He was 62 years old. Commenting on Shatta's death, British journalist Robert Fisk said, The killers of this tiny state make it a point to eliminate all those who might cure Lebanon's cancer peacefully, thus leaving the field open to the wild men of every party. Like a body struck by a destructive illness, Lebanon's immune system does not protect it. Instead, it attacks and hurts it, making it its own ailment. Again and again, the country has allowed the political to sacrifice the personal. Lebanon's families have learned to attack one another, each forgetful that it is Lebanon's streets that are hurt and compromised, that these are its neighbors that mourn a friend, a son, a daughter, a brother, or a sister. Hamad Shatah was known as an economic advisor, a minister, and a diplomat, but also a husband and a father. Well, to me, he was my best friend. And I think that's going to be the hardest part. It's not losing my father. It's losing much more than my father. It's losing my best friend. Uh, he turned to me whenever he wanted to open up a bit. Whatever he had on his mind, not politics, personal. He would, he would reach out to me. He told many people this, and I'm finding this out now, that he really never had enough of the strolls we took whether they were at AUB, on the Corniche, or anywhere in Beirut. He never, never had enough of that. He enjoyed talking to me like a friend, like a great friend. He always respected us as friends, as adults. And, uh, you know, I hope we return that favor to him. I really hope so, because I know that he enjoyed our company greatly. He was always very happy when we came here to see him. He was always taken aback when we would call him and ask, how are you doing? I almost think he didn't know the answer at the point. He's like, why are you asking? He should be asking us. There's a lot of things he did. Um, you know, I could talk about, I could talk about the way he used to challenge me when I was really young with like mental math questions. He was, he was the kind of father, you know, he had an established career at the IMF before he decided to move to Lebanon. He was working tirelessly for his family. And yet, I was a six-year-old, you know, wild-eyed kid coming up to my dad with the most inane questions. I'd come to him, well, aside from even the math questions, so I'd come up to my dad with the most, you know, inane questions, but questions that any child would ask his father. And he always took the time to give me a plausible adult answer. For the last, I would say, two years, consistently, consistently, on a daily basis, come up with ideas. Why don't we go to that place, to this place, to this country, that country, just stay away for a while. Maybe people would just forget you a little. I'm scared, I am all of the above. He would tell me, well, you know, I, do, you want, do you want my happiness? Yeah, of course, I want your happiness. That's where I am happy. I'm happy in this bubble. And when he told me the first time bubble, I had a hard time understanding what's bubble. And I didn't want to show myself that I'm ignorant. So I told him, Muhammad, are you talking about the bubble that I know? He said, you know, we are living in this small bubble. Told him, well, yeah, we're talking about, what, two, three square kilometers? Is this fine with you? He said, I found myself here. You have to understand that we have known each other since 1967. We were classmates. And so I know Muhammad when we were classmates, teenagers, and then we went to the same university, 
both of us studied economics. And uh, then for about 12 years, 14 years, we didn't see each other. Then we became colleagues at the IMF. And then both of us, uh, we were working in a post-war Lebanon, trying to do something for the country. And after 2005, we, you know, we cemented the relationship and we were, uh, we used to discuss everything from politics to psychology to old age to retirement and, and so on. He was a very caring, loving, sensitive. Um, he was really, even as a child, uh, he was never a uh, troublemaker. Like at home, he was always peaceful, trying. Uh, uh, he reads a lot. Uh, he always buy books, magazines, since we were young. Um, he's older than me, but um, he was always uh, like, uh, we fight, we do things, but um, he was very, uh, very calm, very quiet. You said previously that he knew he was a target and that you expected this in a previous interview, and yet he took no caution. My interaction with him, my relationship with him, it looked like the last few months, the last year, he was not on the radar. And he was comfortable in doing things. We'd take strolls on the Corniche. He was out of the decision-making process. He was not in the government or anything like that. He was thinking a lot to himself. He, he had increasing free time. He was showing up later to work. It seemed like he was, in a way, maybe eventually entering a retirement phase. So I did not see that coming. Years earlier, sure, he was threatened. If you go back to the string of assassinations in 2005, 6, 7, 8, yeah, sure. Where were you when you heard the news? What were you doing? I was at home and I heard the explosion. You were here? Or? No, I live in Meta. I, okay. yeah, I don't live here. Ashafi. And you heard the explosion? Yeah. And then? A year or so ago, I was maybe half a kilometer away from Wissam al Hassan's death. It was a similar type of reverberation in the apartment. I knew that there was a, either a car bombing or I, I assumed it was an assassination. But I did not go to the news right away to check who died. And I knew that I would find out anyway. So I decided literally just to go back to the book I was reading and I wanted to, in a, in a way, zone out from what was happening. It's a familiar pattern. When I lived in Hamra, uh, Walid Aidu was killed in Manara, just up the hill. I heard that one. I've been around too many explosions. I was very close to Samir Asir's death in Ashrafi in 2005. I knew it was an I assumed it was an assassination, but I did not put my father on that list. No. And then? Well, my intercom was buzzing. Buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. I was reading in bed. Uh, a friend of mine started knocking on the door, and I thought, I thought she was having relationship problems. She was crying. And she came inside, full of tears, and I didn't know what to say to comfort her, so I said, sit down, I'm sure, I'm sure he's a jerk. Don't, don't listen to him. Don't. And I realized these were not relationship tears. This was something very dramatic. And then she asked me if I had seen the news. I said, no. And I told her, but I did hear an explosion. This was maybe 15, 20 minutes after, around that, yeah. And she sat me down and she said, don't see the news, call your mom. And I said, why would I call my mom about this? And then I started thinking, oh, and I grabbed my phone. She didn't let me look at my phone. I tried to turn the TV on. She was turning the TV off. I started screaming at her. And I said, I need to know what happened. Went back to my phone. I left the apartment went on the news and saw my dad's name. And I broke down.
He was referred to many as a diplomat and then a politician and a thinker. So how do you explain that a thinker and a moderate man is gone today? I think we can safely put his assassination with the other string of assassinations. And he advanced something. He advanced the neutralization of Lebanon. To get there, you need to die in Lebanon. The only way to vocalize that dream, to implement that dream, to think about that dream, you get killed. He was not a decision maker. He wasn't in a position of power, traditional power. He was advising an ex-prime minister. But he did eloquently deliver that message that this country could stand on its own two feet. To get there, you would have to neutralize it from the regional woes that have infected this country for four decades, if not longer. He lived, he lived all his life, even during work, uh, thinking of what the country should do, how they should do it, and the opportunity came in 1993 uh, when um, late Prime Minister Hariri formed his first cabinet and, and uh, personally asked me if I knew people that are willing to come back and contribute to the reconstruction of Lebanon and I named Muhammad uh, and he was seconded to be the vice governor of the uh, central bank uh, and so and I recall it was uh, January 1993 when I first talked with him and asked him if he would be willing to come back and without any hesitation he said I would love to come back. He's been in the country for about you know maybe eight years now. Well, he was in the country for about eight years. Why now? I think that's where I, I go back to what Ronnie was saying. The, not, not the letter. I don't think a letter had to do with his assassination nor did his last tweet because his last tweet was maybe an hour or so before he was killed <laughs> These things are planned way in advance. They're planned months in advance, maybe rehearsed months in advance. So I don't think, I think people are barking up the wrong tree when they are looking at the last tweet or the last letter he wrote or what his last words were. That's, that's not relevant. What he did try to do, and this was his sort of his tour de, tour de force, coup de grâce, whatever. Tour de force. Tour de force, thank you. Um, was that he had a vision, and I spoke with this, I spoke about this with him at length, um, really. It was, it was ever since Obama, um, President Obama uh, decided to refer the potential attack on Syria to Congress. to Congress. When he did, I immediately called him. We had an hour-long conversation uh, immediately about that. And we were talking about how, you know, not, not, no, not venting emotions, not saying frustrations or, or what certain policies we wish this happened or that. We said, okay, what is actually going on here? And, you know, our... I, we both agreed that there was maybe our, our preconceived notion of Iran as a monolithic entity was incorrect. That with the election of Rouhani post the Green Revolution, there appeared to be a, 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 a opening in Iran. Rightfully or wrongfully, we could be completely wrong with this. And what we saw was that the, the uh, you know, Iran's influencers in the region, or Iran's sort of affiliates in, in Lebanon specifically, were maybe not necessarily related to the, or, or answered to a different part of the Iranian, sort of the, the Islamic Republic. So I spoke to my father, I said, you know, maybe there's an opening here for Lebanon to, 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 to make its case. The US and the P5 plus one are making their case in Geneva to, to President Rouhani. The Saudis, the Emiratis, are making their case behind channels, closed channels, a pretty public secret, uh, with President Rouhani. Where's Lebanon on the map? My initial recommendation on that hour-long conversation was, why don't we go, why don't you go speak to your regional allies about this? I think he saw that Lebanon, and this is going to what Rouhani was saying, Lebanon needs to stand on its own two feet. We can't keep going to the Gulf states or going to Iran, or going to the United States, or going to France, or going to wherever. You, you cannot do that. Lebanese have to make their own case, and he 
advocated that strongly, and that's why he actually originally wanted to get the letter signed by members of the Lebanese parliament, which he was killed before he could do that. We would sit here in this uh, living room, and we have on TV, okay, Omar, okay, we have Omar on TV, all right, and Omar, Muhammad and myself sitting here, we're all sharing this letter. Omar is correcting the English part. I am reading and punching myself. Oh my God, oh my God, <laughs> we're heading towards what? And he himself, he was enjoying it. He was, he had this big dream that somewhere, somehow, Mr. Rouhani is one of us. According to our last interview, you have wanted to stick around and you've wanted to stay here. Now you feel like you want to bail or you, you're tempted, as you said, to bail. What makes you stay though? It was that flicker of hope at the end of the tunnel, this dim light that I saw. And I think my father saw a much brighter light at the end of the tunnel. I saw a flicker of light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that light was blown out with my father's death. So I don't know right now if I want to stay. I'm, as I said it before, I'm, I'm talking to my family to see what happens next. But with his death, I lost a lot of hope. We always expected it. I mean, uh, anyone working in public life and, and taking the stand that Muhammad uh, took uh, was uh, at risk. Uh, while I never thought that he was, you know, maybe uh, on top of the list, but we, we always felt, I always felt that he was there. I mean, taking a lot of risk uh, in doing that. And I really think it's, um, he's the antithesis of uh, those who killed him. He's the antithesis. Uh, these are guys that are bullies, they are killers, they understand governing by force. Uh, he was a free spirit, democratic, open to uh, free speech and, and to share uh, experiences and, and, and try to come up with something that uh, is good for the country. And, the people that killed him are exactly the opposite of that. This is a man who obviously cared for Lebanon. Will you continue in his footsteps? Is politics something you think of? Of course I love this country and of course I will want to be here. Want. Will I be here? I will be here and I will move back here and I will raise a family here when I see that there's when, 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 when the marginal change on an annual basis is progressive, not, not, not regressive, when, we're, when things are getting better, not worse, because even before country, sort of the way country is expressed to an individual, it is your family, it is your friend. So I have an obligation to my family, and my obligation to my country is through my family, hopefully that I will have. So I love this place, I will come back here, hopefully, but I gotta see that things are getting better. And I think that's how my father made his choices growing up as well. I wanted to add one thing that my brother is right and I agree with, that he was very pragmatic when approaching problems, but he was also a free thinker. And if there's one thing that I would like to see more in this country, it's that. Willing to maybe look at the bigger picture, step out of the box a bit, find creative solutions. I think that was his talent. And I think that's a talent that is very limited in this country. There's conformity to thought. He did not think that way. He did not approach problems that way. And I think uh, if there's anything that Lebanese should remember him for, it's, it's that. Who is more similar to him in character? <sighs> I've been told maybe a thousand times since the morning began that I have his mannerisms. It could be the way I point, the way I laugh, it could be my voice or the way I express myself, but people always say, He's doing something like his father. I think I took, uh, at least I like to think, I took my father's approach to pragmatism, problem solving, creativity, and logic. I like to think I took from my mom her 
never ending sort of just lovingness and, 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 and care and, and, you know, emotion. Like I, I find myself very much like my mom in that sense. But, uh, you know, I, I find myself sometimes, you know, when I write, if I'm writing a, a paper or something, I find myself sometimes using his voice in, in my words. So I, th I think to myself, my left brain came from my dad, my right brain came from my mom. Imagination. He was an imaginative person. Absolutely. Just and I, I think... As in a visionary? I, I don't know if he was... No, I wouldn't say visionary, but uh, he was a problem solver and he was a creative problem solver. And I always remember him since my childhood thinking out of the box. And I think I took a bit of that from him. Was he a strict father? In what sense? Disciplinarian? Very. Mm, no. I mean, I mean, if you mean in the, in the, I mean, if no, I understand he never, correctly, no, he, he never, never raised a finger. No, 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 but did he like, did he, you know, was he like strict on like getting your homework done, things of the sort? What do you remember of his upbringing? The way he I think he expected us to do our homework and we returned the favor. We did our homework, yeah. but there was never a, you know, shouting or a, uh, you know, he never said you'd disappoint me. On the contrary, he was proud of us and no, he was not a strict father. He was a great father. What's the best advice he ever gave you? The best advice, I don't think he ever said it, but he, he acted it out. This is my last interaction with him. He, uh, he sat here, uh, this was Christmas Day, the 25th, just two nights before he died. And uh, he was telling me a story about his childhood in Tripoli. And it was a bit of a long story, but he sort of gently reached for a bow tie and started putting on the bow tie while he was telling us this strange story about Tripoli. And suddenly the story stopped making sense. Like, why? And then he finished putting on the bow tie. And he looked at us, my, myself and my mom, and he said, well, what do you think? And looking at him, I thought he went a little crazy. And I told him, you look like an outdated butler. Why are you putting on a bow tie? And he's you know, very happy with his bow tie. He said, you know, I think if I wear a bow tie, it'll catch on. I think people will like me with a bow tie. And my mom started laughing. She's like, you really have lost it. I'm like, you really, now it's time to leave, right? Forget the security threats. This is, this is a security threat. Get out of here, right? And he was so happy with his bow tie. And he looked at me for support. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, if you really want to be made fun of, go for it. He said, well, I don't think people make fun of me. Bow tie, it's catching on in other places. It's coming back. I'll bring it back to life. And I said, okay. And he had an obligation that night. He said, go out with your bow tie. And then he sort of got a little startled. He said, hmm, no, I'll, I'll try in a few days. Maybe tomorrow I'll start wearing it. He took it out. And then he reached out for this 35-year-old bow tie that he wore once when he was a student in Texas. He said, I'll test this one out in a few days. The man didn't really care about fitting in. He didn't really care what people would say about him if he had a flashy tie or if he thought of a problem in a very different way. He really didn't care. All he wanted was to be left to his thoughts and express them. He was very eloquent in expressing them. So the best advice, I think, is think freely. Be your own. Don't conform. And to me, he paid the ultimate price for something so basic like that. He never focused on the negative. He was always just pick yourself up and keep going. Personal problems, professional, whatever it is, just stop. Don't, you know, don't feel hopeless or hopeful. Just pick yourself up and move forward. Nina always was worried about him. Why do you want to stay here? Why do you want, let's go, let's move. And he will always tell her, you see, the sea, the nice weather, beautiful Lebanon. Even if we have this small bu bubble, I'm happy. I don't want to give it up. I remember I used to tell him, maybe we could extend the bubble to make it bigger, like a bigger bubble. He always was telling me, let's hope we can keep it the same size. And this is very small. I said, let's hope we can keep it that size. Don't aim high into expanding the bubble. He was scared. He wanted to protect even this small bubble, he wanted to protect it. <sighs> Sometimes you would wonder, uh, 
Why? Why this happened to us? I don't know. I mean, we, we all going to die. We know this for a fact. But not to get killed. Not to be bombed. Muhammad, as much as clever he is, and I know he is extremely clever person, I know for sure, without asking him, this never occurred to his mind that he would be bombed, that he would be killed with 50 kilograms. No. Maybe a pistol, yes. And he was taking the precaution about this. But to be bombed in his bubble, this tells me a lot. Uh, honestly, when he's traveling, every night he has to call to let me know that things are okay. We've been married for 38 years. He's not calling anymore. In the final analysis, Lebanon has an interest in peace, has an interest in maintaining a liberal democracy where individuals can live freely, but also groups can uh, exist here and can express and, and practice their, their, their beliefs. It's not an easy thing to do and often uh, you find uh, the government here taking sort of a uh, uh, middle of the road uh, position on certain things but that's a, a result of uh, what we are who we are and where we are um, and we are likely to continue to do that uh, to the extent that the regional environment becomes better and to the extent that we have peace of course then we can move from this sort of careful uh, uh, navigation to a, a, a more uh, relaxed, more comfortable existence where indeed we can continue the, uh, the good pattern we've had in the last few years and we can even do better and in a generation maybe, maybe we can catch up all the lost time that we had over the last few decades.